Well, hello, everyone. I think we're getting folks to log in momentarily. But thank you for joining us this afternoon or this morning, wherever you're dialing in from, to the Enterprise Sales Meetup webinar series. And we have a really interesting one lined up for folks today. So just want to be able to tee it off. And I'm not going to talk too long because I think uh, a lot of folks know about the Enterprise Sales Meetup, hopefully and all the wonderful things we're doing around B2B sales and our events in eight different cities around the world. But we really want to give this time up to dig into this whole question around lead gen, prospecting, and how to actually build all these teams. In fact, this is something I get uh, as a question quite often. And so I've asked Liz Kane, who is now VP of Go-To-Market Strategies over at OpenView Venture Partners. Uh, previously, she was responsible for building the, the well, they call it the business development uh, team, but essentially the inside sales organization for NetSuite over the past two years and grew up from essentially an idea all the way to a pretty large organization. Liz can uh, share more about what that looked like, but uh, without further ado, I'd love to have you just get kicked off, Liz. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. Um, so for everybody here, you know, my goal today is really just to discuss the evolution of a lead gen team. And, you know, it comes by a lot of names, ADRs, BDRs, SDRs, but it's really the same function, right? That top of the funnel group focused on lead generation and inside sales. And I want to help you think through some of the options you have as you grow that group out. Um, whether it's how many BDRs to hire, where to hire them, the training models you put in place, the compensation structure to incentivize the right behavior, or even how to start specializing them or verticalizing them, that inbound outbound question. So we're going to take a look at a couple of these different areas. And I know it's a lot of topics here, but I think that these are some of the key areas that when you are starting a BDR org or even thinking about starting one, you're having these conversations really early on. I'm of the opinion there's no right answer here. There's not one template to follow. But what I can do is share some of my personal experience in growing one of these teams, and then also um, a perspective as somebody who's now advising startups and working with uh, a number of expansion stage software companies, you know, going through these exact um, problems and making these decisions today. So before I dive in, I just oops, sorry, Mark. Um, I just wanted to take a second to introduce OpenView here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure everybody on the line really knows what we do, but I think we're pretty unique in the VC world. And the reason I say that is our partners are laser focused on investing in expansion stage software companies. And that's allowed us to create a platform to really support and enable their growth. So today, the team that I joined is a team of 15 full-time operators who actually work with the portfolio to hire the right people build repeatable go-to-market strategies, and then also identify new nonlinear growth opportunities through BD and corporate development. So a fairly unique model to have that many people focused on that growth. Um, and then I'd like to talk about quickly what my role is today, because it's a little different too. Um, today, my team focuses on go-to-market, and, and that can mean a lot of different things. But we help our portfolio identify, source, and hire the right talent in marketing and sales roles, almost like an agency. We're taking on those roles for them. Uh, we propose and execute on go-to-market strategy projects that can span customer and market segmentation, uh, buyer persona research, loss reviews, packaging and pricing strategy, uh, and then also more of like the sales side of things. So that's you know setting up a BDR team from scratch, establishing KPIs, getting the right tech stack in place. So really we act as an extension of the team and, and help them do that. Um, prior to OpenView, I was actually with NetSuite for eight years. Um, and, you know, Mark joked earlier, but I was, uh, I guess it's the company formerly known as NetSuite now after the acquisition news by Oracle this morning. Um, but, yes, yeah, so I was there pretty early on, actually, and I started up their lead gen organization. Uh, was an idea, it was a concept in late 2011, and over the span of about four years, we grew to a 170-person organization, hiring over 380 people into the org on the whole. Um, and, you know, great stats, great promotions, and I can speak to that a little bit later. So that's the background of me, and now I really want to dig into the good stuff. Let's do it. All right. So I guess where I wanted to start is this question of how many BDRs to hire. And it's a question I get asked all the time. It's like, how the heck do you figure out the right number? And when I was first starting the team, um, 
it was assigned to me, right? I got tapped on the head at the CEO's initiative and said, I want to try this whole lead gen thing out. Um, now you got to go build a plan. And I think people are looking for you to have a reason to hire that number. And there's a lot of different ways to think about it. So I encourage people to work backwards. And I think there's a few places to start on that. There's a conversation to have around the ratio of BDRs to reps. Or you could think about, are you having a problem with marketing generated leads? Do you need to make up a deficit or fill an area of the pipeline, right? Is there an ultimate end goal that you're driving towards? At NetSuite, we actually worked a little bit differently and we thought about um, this team as the pipeline for promotions and talent. And I mean, truly when we started out, the, the goal was don't screw up lead gen and get out there and build us like 20 amazing ERP sales reps that a year from now can fill roles. So those goals are different, and I'm going to kind of take you through some of the, the ways to think about this. So let's start with ratios. Um, there's a lot of research that's been done on this. Companies at different stages uh, in different markets, enterprise and SMB, have very different thoughts on this project, um, on this process. Uh, one of the companies I'd love to talk about a little bit is Topo, the sales and marketing advisory firm, and they did a ton of research looking across uh, hundreds of software companies thinking about really what is that ideal optimal ratio. And I think there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, they've landed on one to three, one BDR for every three reps. But I've seen in my experience ranging from three BDRs to one rep all the way to one BDR to 10 reps. Uh, it's a broad range. And I think some of the things to think about on that is where does it really cap out on the model? And I think anything above a ratio of about one to five, you see diminishing returns. And it fails because the sales reps don't get a meaningful number of qualified leads, and you don't get that same interaction or alignment where a BDR can really get tight with the rep, understand their needs, understand what qualified looks like to them. And then I think you also need to just think about the volume of leads, and that's a little bit different. So if I can pop to the next slide here, um, this is a super heavy slide to read, and I'm happy to share this with anybody after the webinar. But basically, we built a model out to look at, if you know some of these inputs, and you can make some assumptions on the conversion rate of your you know, dials to connect to appointment. If you know the basic activity levels of your team, and you know that somebody can make 60 dials a day, is gonna send 40 emails, whatever the activity numbers are, then you can start to actually model this out. And you can do it in two ways. So the first way to think about it is, I know that I need to produce X revenue number. So on the left side of the top-down model, the input here is, I'm going to need to create a million dollars in revenue through this team. And if I know that I do X number of dials, and I can do this many activities, and I convert at this rate, you can actually back into how many BDRs you would need to hire in order to hit that. And then the opposite is also true. So let's say you have a team in seed and somebody is saying, how do you predict what you're going to do this quarter or this year? What we do is actually the opposite. So you start with the inputs of the same assumptions that you've made around activity levels and conversion, but you tell us how many BDRs you have and we help you predict the pipeline and revenue that you could expect to influence. So this is actually a really interesting way to start to quantify the, uh, the impact of that team and to get to a harder number on how many you should be hiring. But then I think the last model is a really unique one, and this is what I was alluding to with NetSuite, which is if your goal is promotions and your goal is people, you've got a very different problem to solve. It's not just about lead gen. And you know, I kind of joke about this don't screw up lead gen um, and, and bring the right people in. And that, and that was not easy to do both of those things because we're developing talent and we're trying to get these guys focused and ready for a sales, you know, million dollar quota carrying job a year out, but also need to deliver on today's number. Um, and it took a lot of time in refinement of our onboarding and training and management practices to get us there. Um, but we actually found amazing success with this. And I spent, honestly, the first two years of the program, like, pulling my hair out thinking, these guys are not going to get hired, and I'm going to get to the end of this program, and I'm going to have a whole bunch of sales managers going, why would I hire someone with a year of experience who has never carried a quota? And I'm sure you guys have experienced that too, right? You're going to take a risk on someone here. And as I started selling the team and thinking about it, the things I ran into were, in a big organization, even in a small organization, having a year of knowledge on somebody else is a lot. Right? You start to have the relationships with the sales team and the people you can lean on. 
you've already invested in the company, you're, you're in it for a year, you know more than other people around, and you've got something to prove. Um, so we actually found that if you had a transactional sales model or that kind of lower mid-market, mid-market team, it was a great landing place for folks. And it doesn't work for every business. There are enterprise businesses out there that can't promote their SDRs into reps, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but what I wanted to highlight here is after doing this for a couple of years, we found that we could actually impact both. And ultimately, we looked at prospects created from inbound leads, and over the course of 12 months, we increased the value of those prospects by over 18%. We paid for our team 6x um, in revenue contributions through outbound prospecting in our first year. And we maintained less than 5% turnover on our entire BDR org through the entire four years that I was there. But then what gets really cool is what actually happens when you promote them. So that was all lead gen stats. When they moved on, our BDRs, who were promoted to reps, outperformed street hires in almost everything we can measure. So whether it was time oh, to wow. first deal, average deal size, time to quota, or even average quota attainment, when we looked at 12 months and we said, all right, 12 months out of a BDR program versus 12 months off the street for that lower mid-market, mid-market hire, there were huge advantages to promoting internally. Um, and it came back to just, you know, kind of these items that are on the screen right now and the advantages they had going into the role. Right. And was there anything that you kind of found just in terms of you know, how long it really took? And I know we'll probably dig in a little bit more just on the, like the yeah. onboarding process and training process, but you know, I typically hear of people trying to promote uh, sales development or inside salespeople you know, six months in. That seems pretty yeah, quick. Absolutely. The earliest I ever did was nine months, and then, honestly, it was too fast. Um, I think 12 is like a real minimum. And I guess it also depends on the size of the deal and the type of sale that you're doing, right? So, you know, there's plenty of companies out there. Sales Loft is a great example, right? Um, Kyle Porter has built an awesome uh, career path that has been published that shows a really constant advancement for the team. And in a smaller transactional sale, I think it, it makes sense. You can promote somebody six, nine months in where they can get a lot of at-bats. If you're selling it to more of an enterprise play, I mean, the smallest deals we were doing at NetSuite were still probably, you know, 40K in ARR. And that's a, that's a tough thing to transition somebody into quickly. Right. And I, th I think just from my own experience, when, you, when you're selling a more complex type of solution like NetSuite, Mm -hmm. You're also dealing not just with the product complexity, but also the complexity of understanding the business and the people you're selling into. Yeah, absolutely. The number of the number of people involved in a deal, the sheer number of decision makers, quarterbacking a deal with you know probably six people involved, even internally between a solution consultant and a SOW coming from your delivery group, your you know true like technical or security teams. It's a lot. Yeah, and yeah, you know, that having that, this promotion yeah, having to acquire all that business acumen is you know, also I mean, must be like pretty daunting. Just some of these verticals that you're selling into, you can get really in the weeds. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's part of the um, part of the reason why these internal promotions worked so well because you had a year to really acclimate to that. And even if we were hiring uh, people who were in a similar or tangential industry or even from a competitor, it still took a lot of time to get ramped up on that sales process internally. And our BDR had a head start. Very cool. Yeah. So what next? All about location. Location. Let's okay. Forward here. So, um, you know, it's funny as I as I dig in and I talk right now to um, to founders and sales leaders at prospective companies and in our portfolio. Everybody's got a really strong opinion or like gut reaction to this topic, right? Like it's like I need them at headquarters or I need to have them centralized for knowledge sharing. There's there's a ton of opinions out there, but they're actually not consistent. So I've I've seen some really different models that have been set up. I actually worked with a company recently that's like 100% decentralized. They don't have an office. That's a really different model. Um, so I'm going to walk through a couple of examples here that people have probably been familiar with, but I want to kind of talk through the pros and cons and see what you've heard too, Mark, because I, I don't think there's, a, there's not an easy answer here, and it's really thinking about what's going to work for your business model and how you sell. Sure. So first one here is centralized, right? You put them all in one location, and whether that's at your headquarters or somewhere else, you pick one spot, you put all your BDRs there, 
And there's a lot of advantages to that. So, you know, you get one spot where you're training, you get everybody in one, one place, you have a consistency of message, you have really consistent coaching because you have managers looking over that same group of people, managers knowledge sharing when you get enough people in that scale to have a couple managers in one spot. Recruiting becomes like so much easier because you're pushing them all towards one location. You can focus on a couple of like key schools, companies. You can be building your brand in one area. Um, and then they get to like learn from each other, right? That daily management becomes so much easier. You can encourage the knowledge sharing. But there's also some like very scary things about that. So if you're trying to create that promotion path, the expense of having to relocate all those people at the end of whatever the period is, whether it's 6, 9, 12, 18 months, it's unlikely that you're going to have all of these jobs in one location. And then you've probably also got issues with time zone coverage where you have reps who are in all different parts of the world or even just the United States, right, and, and want somebody either in region or at least covering their specific time zone. But it also limits your recruiting pool. So it's funny. Um, I, I'll give you a really good example of this. I actually I've run into it twice now. One was in Austin, Texas, and the other was in Ireland, where people started putting a ton of inside sales hubs, and for a while it was really inexpensive and talent was really good. And you know, fast forward a few years, and you've got like a lot of the big guys have major offices there, and because it's become so oversaturated the expense has skyrocketed and it's really hard to secure talent and you're paying way more than the market like actually dictates. Well, I guess the market is dictating you pay a lot, um, but way more than you'd expect for somebody, you know, even three years before you could have gotten at half the price. So really, um, really interesting as you think about those models to watch where, um, where other people are going and thinking through if there is an area that can be centralized that takes away some of that cost or allows you to capitalize on some of the pros here. Yeah. Sure, and you know, I just uh, anecdotally, you know, I've heard a lot about Dublin, and you know, it's become you know very much a tech center in you know for Europe uh, for a lot of reasons. But you know, coincidentally, it's also become a really expensive place very quickly. You know, still not relatively speaking to a place like London, but it, it is interesting that just how yeah. how quickly that that happens. Now, I'm also seeing kind of interestingly enough the same thing happen in places like Denver. Where you have yeah, a lot of folks just they're, they're, and I think NetSuite has an office out there, right? So yeah, uh, we, we may have seen some of that as well. Austin was definitely my biggest one, but yeah, absolutely Denver too. Um, and and they're popular cities. A lot of people are like moving there or excited to work there, but it's just become much more competitive from a hiring standpoint. So how is that going to contrast then if you you have you know this territory model you know versus mm -hmm. like a regional hub model to maybe. Uh, provide a little bit more flexibility in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the regional presence, I think, is interesting. I think there are some business models that really dictate a need to have somebody in seat in a actual community where they can build those face-to-face -face relationships. Um, I'm actually working with a company right now, uh, CTS out of New York, and you know they're really interesting. They're selling to commercial real estate, and it's all about being on the ground. It's about who you know. And they need people to be in region, focused on, hit, like literally boots on ground, meeting people. And it's about that network effect and the connections you can make. And so if you have that kind of field team, I mean, there's an argument for putting these BDRs in the field too, right? You start to create those team synergies and tight alignment. If you have that business model that allows it, you can easily promote within region with minimal cost or disruption to your business model. But it, it takes a really exceptional manager to manage a team dispersed like this. The, the training, very difficult. Doing any sort of remote coaching and maintaining you know, even consistency and administration across the group. Rolling out new processes is extremely difficult. So I think where you start to see some benefits is if you can combine those two. And, and that happens at scale, right? It's not something that happens early on in a business, but it's what you start to think about and are aiming towards. Um, as you reach that scale, you have the opportunity to create regional hubs. And you know, a hub doesn't need to be 10 or 20 people, it could be three. But it's a place where you start to see a combination of those two models. So I can give you the example of NetSuite. Um, I started with a team of 18 people in Boston. The following year, we hired, rehired in Boston, and then we hired in Denver. By 2015, I had five locations in the US, and then I'd added international teams in London, Sydney, Toronto, and Singapore. 
And the beauty of those hubs was I had each manager on his or her own that had their like hiring schedule. And they had recruiting synergies within their region because they were very focused on it. But then I also was able to alleviate some of the more difficult aspects around onboarding and coaching through centralized resources. And you know, this was became really what was much easier for us when we weighed the pros and cons of cultural aspect of having people in the offices, minimizing the cost of relocation, actually getting scale at recruiting. Um, and there's other companies that are doing it very differently, right? I've seen, um, I've seen a couple of companies who are investing very heavily in one area. For example, like InsideSales.com has a huge team in Utah, right? It's where they're putting everyone. So I think there's, there's definitely um, pros and cons here, and it's weighing your options and figuring out which one's really going to work for your business. I think that actually segues really well into the conversation of training. And training is one of those things that you need to consider when you're thinking about hiring locations. You know, I had, um, I had a sales leadership forum at the OpenView office last week, and we had 75 uh, sales VPs and CROs in our office. And the number one question I heard all week was just, how do you optimize onboarding to decrease the ramp time, alleviate the strain on your managers, and just get people ramped up into quota faster? And I don't, you know, it faces BDRs and sales teams alike, but it's not easy. And early on in a business, it's a necessary evil that you're hiring one-offs, right? You just have people coming in in these individual roles. Eventually, you hope that you kind of get like two or three at a time, right? That cohort, cohort <laughs> model. And when you get to scale, right. like maybe you get to do a boot camp. But it's, it doesn't happen immediately. Um, and so I think there's some opportunities to try to optimize that within your company, regardless of the size you're at. Um, I have actually, I'm working with somebody right now who just told me that they did their ninth individual onboarding of the year. So we're halfway through the year and their onboarding is two weeks. So they've literally spent 18 weeks of the year so far onboarding individual reps. And that's just so disruptive to the rest of the team. Like how do you create a cadence in team meetings? If you want to cover a topic, you've got like seven people at different points in their ramp and onboarding. So difficult. Um, you know, it, it just pulls the manager back and can burn them out from repetition. So I think there's a yeah, couple of opportunities to help with that. Um, one, if you can kind of get the buy-in from the, the group at large to try to cohort those people. And if that means that you bring somebody in one month sooner or one month later than you might have done, I think you actually get the productivity gains back because the training isn't so rushed. There's not that like attitude of, I've delivered this nine times. Like I start skipping topics, right? I'm like, why don't you get it? I get this. <laughs> and you go, you go <laughs> fast. They don't learn as well. Um, and, and I think that cohort model becomes important because you give them more dedicated attention. You spend more time on training. Uh, I tried a model for a while where I was having people start at the start of every quarter. And I said I would do four trainings a year, and we would bring everybody in during that time. And sure, you know, there's one-offs, right? I always had one or two people that couldn't make it work with their schedules. But it actually allowed us to create way more scale with what we were doing. Um, and I think whether you're doing that individual or cohort model, you need to think about some ways to optimize for the manager's time. And so some of the things I think about as I'm working with um, our, you know, our expansion stage software companies, people who are in their early stages of a BDR program, is how to alleviate the manager so it's not two weeks locked in a conference room. And so some of the things we're putting into place are you know, buddy programs, a lot of shadowing, but it has to be interactive. It has to be that there's conversations happening and that you're encouraging people to actually give feedback and not just you know passively sit on a splitter. We do a well, lot of self-tasting. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, that's a lot of really good points because yeah, you know, I I see a lot of man, like you know on the ground manager burnout just because it it there is so much these one-offs and it's kind of interesting kind of be able to to think about different ways of being able to not just optimize but also to be able to kind of share in some of the responsibilities and have. Some people be able to take on things like having some coaching sessions with some of the others that have folks that are shadowing and put a lot of those pieces in place. So it's not just all encompassing. It's not a manager and you know, one or a few different BDRs that they're bringing in in a conference room for two weeks. And that's pretty much yeah. it for the manager's time. Mm -hmm. And then I think also like if you can build out any of that content in advance, 
So if you can think through like, well, A, great documentation is needed, right? So that it's not answering every one-off question about Salesforce or about your lead management process or mm -hmm. about your methodology for prospecting. But documentation, but then also like if you can start to bucket it up. So let's say I'm going to run a team meeting on objection handling today. Rather than it being just me talking to folks, can I find a way to capture that information so I can deliver it again three months later or that my, you know, team lead or like my most senior BDR can start to do that content again and creating a library where that gets housed, that has become um, hugely effective in a lot of our companies. And then I also love the team lead model, just taking your BDRs who are top performing and giving them a little bit more responsibility as you go, right? Whether it's having them do some one-on-one -on -one coaching or leading a team meeting or taking on a strategic initiative, people who are itching for that next role and responsibility will eat it up. Right. No, it's definitely definitely some good thoughts. And actually, one of the things that's coming to mind is, as we're talking about like documentation, trying to you know, do a lot of these things in a much more repetitive and just manageable way. Uh, I had a, a session at the Enterprise Sales Meetup. It was uh, maybe last October or November, and had a gentleman who was uh, who was brought in as one of the earliest hires over at Yotpo oh, no. as the head of sales training. Not just thinking about the BDRs you're bringing on, but also bringing yep. on people that can actually support at the same time. So again, you know, trying to offload some of the burden of the manager having to put together you know, all the training, all the documentation, all the monitoring in place to make sure that the, mm -hmm. the reps end up being successful. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you raise that. I think that, that sort of training hire is happening a lot earlier. We're seeing that trend too, and it's often a a generalist who's doing you know, some operations, some enablement, spanning a couple of different functions, but definitely getting hired way earlier than we've seen in the past. That productivity resource, I guess that's what I'd really call it. Yeah, productivity, enablement. I'm hearing a lot of different like, names for it. Mm -hmm. It's just interesting that in that one case, they said, oh no, you are the head of sales training. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, well, what do I do? Hey. <laughs> I'm here to figure it out. <laughs> that's great. Um, the last model I wanted to raise here was just the boot camp one, and I think a lot of companies have adopted the model of the sales boot camp. Uh, you know, probably the one you hear about the most is Oracle's class of where they, you know, brought in like 400 BDRs. Everybody moved out to California for an eight-week training session. They learned selling tactics. They got immersed in the culture, and then they pushed them out into different various offices in the field. You know. I think it gives people a step up to get immersed in that kind of way if you're then going to go out and be in remote offices. And it also allows them to have those connections across the company where they're not just ingrained in their office, but they have this group of people that they can reach out to and see and connect with at the company globally. Um, you know, while I gave the Oracle example, I see that happening in much smaller companies too, right? So if you're going to have a couple of satellite offices, do you bring people to headquarters to actually onboard, right? Make sure that they're meeting the founders, that they're getting that company culture aspect and meeting the key players face-to-face -face early on. Especially if you have remote people, um, I think that that like face-to-face -face connection is so key. It allows them the opportunity to feel like they have a bond and can reach out to those people. And I think it also helps those of us who've been around a while not forget about the people in the field, right? I think it's very easy to look at what's in front of you and solve those problems and not be constantly thinking about the folks that are, you know, 2,000 miles away. Yeah, exactly. It's it just like when I was at SIBA when I started early on, uh, you know, I thought in the New York office and uh, SIBA was located in San Mateo, out in California. But being able to have the time early on during my career at SIBA, helped me to actually connect with a lot of the product managers that were so instrumental in a lot of my deals as I started to bring in business. And mm -hmm. if I hadn't had those personal connections, it would, be, it would have been a lot more difficult to get the resources and things I needed to bring some of those deals closure. So I think definitely the boot camp model for me, I know just my own personal experience was a huge benefit for my own brand and productivity. Yeah, absolutely, and we're seeing that pretty consistently, that there's great feedback on the boot camp, that there's a real jump start to people's um, careers at the company. All right, so, so two more topics here. One's the big one, comp. Comp, right? yeah. <laughs> Interesting, because I get a lot, of, a lot of questions about this, and I think there's still just a lot of uncertainty about compensation, particularly when you're dealing with folks who are 
just early in their sales career. So I'd love to hear kind of what you've learned about doing this well. So it's funny, the same conference last week, I had two great speakers here, Mark Roberge from HubSpot, and then yep. Steve Johnson, who was the CRO at Hootsuite um, when it you know hit 100 million, right? Gro- high growth, big companies, a lot of hiring, and uh, they had very different takes on how to count people. And it was interesting to kind of hear the perspectives of people in the room as well. So I'll walk through a couple of ideas. Um, and I'll tell you, I think it's um, it, it's something that's very uh, unique to a company and making sure that you're getting everybody aligned uh, across that entire sales org. And one of the things that comes into play here, regardless of compensation, is very clear definitions. So if you're going to pay, pay people on MQLs or SALs or opportunities, I care less about what that is and more that everybody agrees to what it is. Right? And I see that Good disconnect point. between BDRs and sales just constantly. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I'm going to do is just kind of talk through the couple of things where I think, think this has a huge amount of play. So bringing talent in is huge. Um, the comp plan that you structure, how you talk about it, how you talk about attainment of the team, I think it has a really big part in how you secure the right talent and whether it's top talent, if they're, if they're looking at you going, saying, I'm not sure I'm going to make the money you're saying I am. Um, Two is incentivizing the right behavior, figuring out what your company culture is and what is the behavior that you want. And that also has to align between the two teams, like we were just saying. And then finally, retaining talent and making sure that you have a plan, whether it's for compensation or career path or both, and how you align those things over time. So I'll start with the securing talent component, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we at OpenView have recommended to our portfolio, and when I get asked this question, really how I answer. So ideally... We want to have a base that's high enough that your your paycheck is something that you can count on, right? When you're an entry level in a BDR role, you're not making a ton of money. We want to be in a position where we're not like hurting and thinking about how do I get that bonus. It wants to be, I have some stability, I can train, I can onboard with some comfort, and now I get to go make more money. That bonus component, we say about 30%. I see people range from sort of that 60-40 to 80-20 I like the 70-30 model personally. I think it sets up enough of an uh, incentive to go make some more money, especially if it's uncapped. So sample composition for us would be 40% set on meetings occurred and 60% on opportunities when you break down the variable. Again, having tight definitions I think is super important. And then I love to put a kicker out there. So whether it's a spiff, um, a bonus, uh, something they can count on regularly that ties to quality and making sure the deals actually get closed. So for example, 10% of MRR, 0.89% of ARR, and you can figure out what the right number is for your group. Um, But really making sure that there's a reason for them to be bringing in deals that close and not just filling the funnel with as many meetings as they can get. Is that kind of what you've seen in the market, or are you seeing anything different, Mark? All right, I'll keep doing here. Um, so I think the, the next thing is really figuring out what you care about as a company, and incentivizing the right behavior can be interesting, right? Um, whether it's aligning the actual incentives in your variable comp. Um, I was actually meeting with a sales leader this week who told me that they, uh, they did away with meetings occurred, and they decided that the focus for their lead gen team had to be on opportunities. And, you know, I think that's difficult. It's not something they can always control, but if you have a team that has the ability to take it far enough and is trained up enough, I think it's great. Um, the other way to look at this is really more around spiffs. Um, you know, what do you need to spiff? Do you care about having clean de- data in your CRM? Do you want to care about activity levels, right? Do you know that getting your activity up will uh, will help your conversion rates down the road? You could spit a particular campaign. You could even encourage people um, to be more of like a team lead to take on more responsibility through those spits. So we're actually running a spit survey right now, um, and I'd love for anybody on the line to actually take it and just share with us what's really working for you and what kind of incentives you're putting out there to your team. Um, and what we're going to do is we're actually going to share that information back out um, publicly through our lab site in the next you know month or so. And then the final kind of thing I want to talk about here is that retention play. And in my mind, there's really a couple of things you have to play with when you think about retention. 
And you know, that's a high turnover position. So anybody in that BDR, lead gen, inside sales kind of role, the industry standard tends to be about 30% turnover annually. That's high. There's a high cost to that. Um, so what we like to think about is, what are the motivators of the people? And I think there's a couple of ways to address it. One is to show career path. And not every business has the opportunity to do that. But can you create some smaller promotions? Can you go from a BDR to a senior BDR to a team lead? Can you keep your top employees motivated by giving them some very clear benchmarks of what gets them there? Um, you know, I, I got a great question from a company last week. They said, we love that. We set it up, and then we got to 12 months in, and the company wasn't doing as well as we wanted, and we didn't have the roles available. And now what do we do with these people? So I think that's really interesting, and I guess one of the things I would think about as you set up one of these plans is something's guaranteed, right? You're working in a startup environment. You're working um, at a company who believes and wants to do these things for you, and this is like a minimum. So if you get to six months and you hit these goals that we've laid out for you, you will be considered for promotion. It can't be a guarantee. And I think it's important to set that expectation early on and make sure everybody's kind of working towards the same goal. Excuse me. Um, the second thing I would just say around this is just making sure that they have control over the dollars and they understand how they get paid. I've worked with a couple of teams recently who really struggle to calculate that number. They have very complicated comp plans or it's not really visible in the CRM. So as much transparency and visibility you can bring to compensation and when they might expect a raise, a bonus, um, or even just their like commission check, I think that's huge in retention. Um, and I raised this on the spiff, but I think one thing to think about too is how you get teams working together. And I think we all tend to lean towards individual spiffs and we pay out the person who's top performing or they got the biggest deal or that hit the highest quota achievement. But if you can bring people together and you can even divide a team in two and say team one versus team two, let's see how many collective appointments we can get. Or if the entire team hits their number, right? Some of those incentives bring people together and actually raise the performance of everybody in the group because they're helping each other. Those are kind of my thoughts on incentives here. I don't know if anybody has questions or Mark, if you have any other thoughts on, on the uh, retention and comp piece. All right, well then, let's, uh, let's wrap up then with the division of labor. So I think the, um, this is a question that just comes up all the time. It's how to focus and specialize the team so you drive the highest performance. Is it time to specialize? Is it time to verticalize? Do I need inbound versus outbound? Do I need an international team? Do I need regional support? And deciding when that happens you know, it's hard when you have only a few resources. Um, we have some benchmark studies that are out there and I can share that with the group, but for now I just kind of want to talk through these three options and how they develop over time. So the first one is that inbound outbound question. Does it make sense for your business to have a team solely dedicated to inbound or solely dedicated to outbound? And I think, you know, the more time I've spent, the more I agree that specialization is key. As soon as you give an outbound rep a couple of inbound leads, you see this dip in productivity, right? They start to rely on the thing that's easier rather than chasing and hunting new business. But mm. depending on your business model, sorry, Mark, did you have a question there? No, no, I, I was just kind of really focused on the specialization because I, you know, I've kind of seen also like a, like a third tier and four tiers of specialization. But but yeah. let's just dig in on on the inbound outbound just right now. Yeah, so the one question I'm getting that I find really interesting is, okay, I buy into inbound versus outbound, but what does that mean for account-based selling, right? So I have an outbound team dedicated to these few accounts, and my inbound team gets a white paper download, right? How do I make sure that that outbound rep is aware? And so I think there's some really, um, there's some really important stuff that you need to consider when you're making this, de making this decision. So the first thing I look at is, are the inbound leads that are coming from your marketing team one call closed, so to speak? Are they the right contact that you'd actually want a meeting with? Or when you get that lead, are you then going, who are the other three contacts I should call? And I think there's a big difference there, right? If your marketing team yeah. is generating a list of accounts that you should go target, it's not really an inbound role. 
Right? You're just asking somebody to do prospecting with a different starting point of their list. Um, and then on the outbound side, I think it's very similar. I think these guys are often focused on an account-based approach. They're targeting multiple contacts. They're coordinating with their reps. They're coordinating with marketing. And they do need to know any marketing activity that's occurring. So making sure you set it up to ensure that those teams, even if they're separate, are aligned. Um, can be really hard to do in Salesforce. We've got a database of leads and accounts. And you know, I don't want to dig super deep on that right now, but I'm happy to chat with people if that's um if that's an interesting topic down the road because I do think that uh that actual technology setup and how you set this up in your CRM is key to making this work. Yeah, I mean what are the other levels you extremely got, good Mark? point. Well I was just gonna say that uh you know, part of it sometimes is a matter of like how your how you view your inside sales organization, whether it's merely just to set appointments or are you really trying to qualify a little bit farther down down the line? So that's also kind of a consideration just in terms of a specialization standpoint is what is the type of uh, inside sales organization and what is the function that they're trying to perform? Uh, perform? You know, the other side of it is also, you know, is it in marketing? Is it in sales? who controls what. So I think you know, there's a lot of broader considerations organizationally for companies that are starting to build out their teams as to you know, who's kind of reporting where and how does it actually function within the organization and, the, and that intersection between leads that marketing essentially controls and sales. You know, I saw a great... I guess it wasn't really a stat, but a good comment on that recently. Um, John Miller at Engageo was sharing where he sees these teams aligning. And when they're doing more inbound, those teams continue to report to marketing, and it makes a lot of sense because marketing owns from lead creation through qualification and the promotion of sales. As that team shifts more heavily to outbound, that's when they start reporting to sales and where the alignment gets really tightly integrated with the sales organization. And it was funny, it's very intuitive when you think about it, but I've never really looked at a business and thought of it that way before. Right, those inbound heavy no. teams tend to support marketing. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense. And it actually yeah. reflects a lot of what I've seen as well. Awesome. So I guess the next level of specialization I'll talk about is really more around verticals. And I think those can come in two ways. So I'll, I'll even give you the example at NetSuite. I started by saying inbound versus outbound. Right? I had half of my team on inbound, I had half of them on outbound, and pretty quickly I realized that that wasn't enough. And if you're selling to industries that have really unique business needs, you need to be able to like sound like them, look like them, speak the lingo, and like really get ingrained in their business problems. And so what we ended up doing is we divided the team further, and we started to say um, inbound versus outbound isn't enough, and we need you to actually focus on inbound telecom or outbound retail. And we actually went further and we said, okay, what about the size of company? So as you get you know, a really significant team, I had about 150 individual contributors, um, that specialization gets tighter and tighter. So I literally had somebody covering uh, under 100 employee software companies in Boston, the 617 area code. Right? So you get super narrow on where your business is really focused from an outbound standpoint. Um, and actually inbound too, slightly broader, but the same concept of how do I make sure that this job is repeatable and that when I get on the phone I have the same message so I can actually get more done in a day. That was, that was really important to us. Um, and then the last thing I'll raise is really more around geo support. I've got uh, North America on here, but I think it's a global thing too. And actually the first place that I see it pop up is, all right, we put two sales reps in England. Who's going to do lead gen for them? And suddenly you've got one BDR over there. And, you know, you might have a North America specialization between inbound and outbound, and you might have verticals. And then you've got your one person who's sitting in an office in London who's actually doing it. Right. right? Um, and right. I think that that's like pretty natural, and that is the evolution of it. And, you know, I wouldn't even undo that, but I think it is important to think about um, – can you align people to territories and can you create that really solid connection between a rep and a BDR so that you don't have one rep having to coordinate with you know, a couple of different BDRs that are feeding them leads? And that can happen on inbound and outbound. Sure. Yeah, it's, um, I, I think it's a natural. You know, I think about when you're talking about the different types of models and locations 
uh, location set up. You know, where I see kind of the evolution on, on the early stage startups, uh, yeah. whereas what I typically spend a lot of my time is you know, they're not going to have a lot of things up to speed. And I think a lot of the evolution, you know, for folks that are online that are more in the startup universe, you know, a lot of things, a lot of stuff will start to coalesce and come together. So even though your model may be you're just doing a whole bunch of one-off trainings and you may have people in different places and it doesn't seem all that coordinated, yeah, I think what you're really talking about is like when you start to scale up and you start to do more things at the same time, you'll start to see the evolution of the model build out. And you know, even you know, in international expansion is a good point as well. Very similar. I see organizations setting up in you know, an Asia Pac region and a MIA region, and it's very much like starting over again. Awesome. Um, well, you know, Mark, this is actually kind of the, the wrap up for me. So, I, you know, I, I think we went through these kind of five key areas between hiring, locations, training models, compensation, and specialization. And, you know, from my perspective, like I said, I don't think there's a template here. I don't think there's one way to do it. And what I really wanted to do was just uncover some ideas and help people start thinking through the problems that you might face as you scale a team and the pros and cons to some of these decisions. And like I said, I've seen these all in play. Each of the things I talked about today, I've worked with companies doing these things. And some work, some don't, and they evolve, right? Um, so with that, I guess I'd open it up to questions here. And you know, if there's anything else that I can highlight for you, Mark, I'd love to do that too. Yeah, I think one question that comes through is, do you, um, you know, when you think about compensation, and you think about how you structure it. I mean, I, I, you were talking about the 70-30 model, which I think is good, kind of makes sense. Uh, but it, do you ever, like, or have you seen, like, room where organizations put in maybe MBOs, management by objectives as well, as part of bonus, as, a, as opposed to purely based on the sales metrics? Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, I actually ran that as a significant portion of the compensation that was variable at NetSuite. And we changed it based on where a BDR was in their tenure with the program. Um, so I alluded to the fact that one of our key focuses was on actually transitioning people into the next role. And so there were development opportunities. So in the first quarter in seat, rather than thinking about a number of leads, we actually were incentivizing, like creating the right behaviors and habits. So we measured people on their touch plan and following through a contact to the end of it. So if you had to leave, let's say, five emails and five voicemails before you could consider a lead non-responsive, did you take it all the way through that process or did you abandon it after two touches? And so we were actually paying people on like creating those right habits. And then as we moved further into the program, we started talking about, all right, now let's see what you can get out of that. You showed us that you can follow the process, now show us what the output is. And, of course, the managers were paid on the output the whole time, but we were trying to get them focused on the activity and behaviors we knew would lead to success. Um, as we got even further along, we started actually paying them on their training and development. So there would be like 20% of their comp in a month would be around like doing different demo checkpoints or competitive intelligence or partner knowledge. And then eventually that actually became a series of trainings that helped them transition, so building a territory plan, uh, some negotiation training, working through closed plans. So, you know, yeah, I think management by objectives is fantastic, and I think if you want people to focus on it and you want to make training a core part of your culture, you have to incentivize it. Yeah, I think I think it's a good point, and particularly as we, you know, as we focus on, well, how, how are we going to you know, develop the, the whole sales rep? Part of mm -hmm. it's obviously the responsibility of the organization to get them up to speed on process, but it's also this body of knowledge that I think, you know, doing something like an MBO program can definitely take, give them a little bit of ownership to do like a lunch and learner, to do some of these programs that, you know, is additive to the whole team, but as well to that individual contributor. The, the second thing that comes to mind, uh, you know, as we're talking about career path particularly, and this is something that uh, someone asked me recently, what do you do with folks where you spent 12 months to 18 months getting them up to speed to become an AE or you know, a quota carrying sales rep, and they don't want to go into sales. Uh, I've had a few of those. Um, yeah, so I think you need to make a decision as a company, and if you have appropriate roles, 
and that person is a good employee, I don't know why you wouldn't make that available. Um, I think where I've seen people struggle is, I really want to keep this person, but I don't have an obvious role for them. And then we start creating something too custom, and it's not repeatable. Or you start right. seeking out those generic, like general athlete kind of players rather than looking for sales skills. And so, you know, if I think about the recruiting process, that shouldn't be a lot of people, right? You should be vetting it hard enough that when you get to the end, you've got people who are so eager to take on, you know, a quota bearing role in your organization that it's not an everyday conversation. And if you have a few outliers, I think you make the exception. Um, I've had, you know, people who were exceptional employees who hit their number, who did exactly what I needed as a BDR, who got to the end and were like, I can't think of something I want to do less than carry a quota, but like, I'll go take this job over here and be in field events or in enablement or, um, you know, I've had people take on an operations role within my group, a recruiter, and I think that's fantastic, right? If you can keep that knowledge and employee for the company and have the ability to do it, why not? Sure. And actually, that brings up, maybe we'll leave this as a last question, <coughs> but uh, you, you mentioned hiring. And uh, you also mentioned Mark Roberts before. I think he had a really interesting perspective uh, that he shares about hiring and the sales acceleration formula, his book that he wrote last year. What what did you find? Because you, you had to develop an or, basically an organization from scratch, do it repeatedly, do it around the world in multiple places, and you hired a lot of folks quickly. Yeah. Were there any kind of salient lessons that you learned out of you know, how to hire well at that stage? stage of salesperson? Yeah, there's a couple of things we looked for. Um, I'll give you kind of the quick rundown here. There were four, we had, a, we had a pretty baked process, but there were four interviews that we went through. Um, the first was sales skills. And to me, uh, that is not like your normal sales interview of you know, peers past plan when you're interviewing somebody who really hasn't sold before. It's looking for the qualities that make a salesperson successful. And for us, that was somebody who was an active listener, who was supremely curious, who wanted to learn and understand what other people were doing, and who were very intrinsically motivated. And somebody who could kind of drive themselves and had that mentality of like, get up and do it another day, right? Sure. Um, I found that that was, you know, we, we talk about athletes or people who have been really competitive. You know, I found that that actually was more about dedication to something and follow through. So I had people who were, I actually had like a, a professional ice skater, somebody who was like the captain of their chess club, right? Like, I don't think it matters what it is, but I like to see that like passion for something. Um, th so that was, the, that was more on selling skills. The second one that was really important to us was patterns of behavior and how they make decisions. And, you know, that interview for me was always the most telling, and it really informed business judgment. Like, am I going to trust you to make a decision in the moment when you're on the phone with a prospect? Do I, am I just going to, like, know that you're going to do the right thing? Uh, so I would ask about, you know, how they chose their college, how they chose their classes, how they chose their first job, why they worked for a certain manager, why they left, and what they learned from those experiences. Uh, and you get some really thoughtful answers. And then the final two, I use the word horsepower. I've heard grit. Um, to me, it's intelligence plus motivation, right? It's the, it's the two things that get somebody to be able to learn and then keep doing it. And we were selling a complicated product. I need somebody that was smart and dedicated to what we were doing and could pick it up. Uh, and then the final thing is cultural fit. And I, I don't, I think people downplay that for skill sometimes. If that person isn't going to succeed in your organization, they could be the best sales rep in the world they may not work for you. Um, and I think that needs to be really one of the primary things you're looking at when you hire. And you need to know what your own culture is. No, all good points. Uh, Liz, I really appreciate the time. I think this was really brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for sharing some of the, the just wealth of knowledge that you that you brought to bear and that you continue to bring to bear now at OpenView Partners. Uh, is there anything, uh, any kind of last thoughts or things that you'd like to just share with uh, with our audience this afternoon? No, I think we've covered it. Thank you for having me. Thank you, and I guess I'll, I'll see you next week. Awesome. All right. All right. Talk to you later, Bye -bye. Liz. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, it's been a pleasure.